Good evening and welcome to our last Wednesday Lenten uh, Zoom service for 2024. Tonight is March 20th. Our theme tonight, based on one of Jesus's last words or expressions from the cross, is into your hands. We will begin our worship then uh, using the Holden Evening Prayer beginning. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here.
Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for calling us together. Help us to learn from your very last words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a couple of scripture readings to share. The first is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. This is from a more contemporary translation called The Message. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction, but for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. It's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as shams. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent, in this day and age. Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world and all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered stupid, preaching of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified. Jews, Jews treat this as an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us, who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom, all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so cheap, so impotent, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. Take a good look, friends, as at who you are, who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the best and the brightest among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and even abuses? Chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate, a fresh start, everything that we have comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. I like that modern translation. And then a more traditional translation of Jesus on the cross from Luke 23. It was now about the sixth, sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the multitudes who assembled to see the sight when they saw what had taken place returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and saw these things. Here ends our gospel reading. Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Shortly on Sunday, we'll begin our Holy Week journey with Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And we know the rest of the story. Most of us have heard it many times of the, of the betrayal and the arrest and the, and the trial, whatever it was. Not a very fair trial. And then, of course, the crucifixion and these words of Jesus. There's two kind of final words of Jesus. The other is, um, it is finished. But in this version from Luke, we have, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's an interesting choice of words because wouldn't Jesus have committed his spirit to God all along, put his whole life in God's hands? And yet, here we have this sense of 
completion. What does it all mean? I think Pastor Rob has a very nice reflection on this tonight, so I'll let her speak for herself. We'll go ahead and share the screen again. There's an island off the coast of Scotland called Iona, and it, it was. Oops, hold on just a second. I had a little problem there. Let's start this over. Sorry about that. Just when I think I have this stuff all down, I am humbled. So I apologize. Let's try this again. off the coast of Scotland called Iona. And it, it was thought to be, or is thought to be, the birthplace of Christianity in Scotland. In 563, there was a monastery built there and pilgrims flock there every year because Iona is known to the Celts as what is called a thin place. And a thin place is a place where it seems as if heaven and earth touch where the veil between heaven and earth becomes negligible. So Iona is known as a thin place. And I think a thin place can be found most anywhere. You probably have experienced thin places in the mountains or the beach or when you're praying your devotional time in a specific chair in your home. I've experienced thin places sometimes in people's dying hours. Sometimes I've told you I have the privilege of being present with people as they're dying and with their families as they're dying. And what's interesting is that often in these times, people know that they are about to leave and go from the arms of God here into the arms of God from life into eternal life. And so those moments often when we're with those families seem to be most sacred. It seems to be that people say, you know, I was afraid of this moment and it wasn't pleasant to watch my father die or my mother die. And yet this was just a most sacred time. It was a thin place. I've experienced a, a thin place personally when I was with a couple and they had asked me if I would come and sit with them because they knew their infant was dying. So I went to the hospital and we sat and they said, would you just pray? for us and, and with us until our child passes away. And so I did. And so in the hours that went through, we just, sometimes we sang some songs, some psalms, some, we prayed together, we read scripture and we prayed some more. And when the baby passed away, and after the moments when we could kind of talk about this as with the family, Almost everyone in the family said that they felt the presence of God in that place like they never had before. That moment had become a thin place. When Jesus gathers and his friends are gathered around him on the cross, they experience a thin place too. So as Jesus is dying on the cross, the last words that Jesus speaks in Luke's gospel is into your hands, I commend my spirit. And both Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that as he says these words, or after he says these words, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. And this is very significant. 
because in the temple, uh, in the temple there are two places on the inner court. One is the holy place and the other is the holy of holies and they're connected. And in the holy place, the priests are allowed to be there. They make sacrifices there. And then there is a veil. There is a heavy veil, a heavy curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, is kept the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the Ten Commandments. And it is believed that God's presence, God's very throne resides there. And so what is significant about this is that only the high priest can enter under the curtain and only one time of year when he goes in to atone for the sins of himself and for the sins of the people of Israel for sins that are both known and sins that are unknown. The significance of this is that the temple curtain at Jesus' death is torn in two. And what that signifies is that all of a sudden Jesus becomes our high priest and not only our high priest, he becomes once and for all the one who atones for our sins, the one who saves us from our sins the one who forgives our sins. So the temple is torn in two and we have direct access to the presence of God. The interesting thing about Jesus saying these words, into your hands I commend my spirit, is that they are actually a prayer. Jesus has now, this is Jesus' now third prayer from the cross. The first was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The second was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now we hear a third prayer. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. This is a prayer that Jesus would have learned as a child. Is it a prayer that Mary would have taught him perhaps? as a bedtime prayer, because it was a bedtime prayer for many children. It's a lot like the, the prayer that I learned as a child that many of you may have learned as a child. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's the same sort of prayer, but it also comes from a Psalm. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. It's a Psalm of trust in the Lord. It's a Psalm again, that Jesus would have known the rest of the words to. And Jesus would have said, oh Lord, I trust you. I trust in your hands. And I know that I will abide in you and that you will deliver me and save me. Jesus's entire life was shaped by prayer. He learned this prayer as a child. He would have said prayers in the synagogue. They would have said prayers at home. We see in the gospels that Jesus prays before he chooses his disciples. When he's had a long day, he goes to the mountains and he prays to God. Sometimes he prays all night. Jesus is, then teaches his disciples how to pray. Jesus' whole life is formed by prayer. And so it's not surprising that he begins his words on the cross and he ends his words on the cross with a prayer because his life has been formed by prayer. And he is giving us this example that our life too might be formed by the prayers he shows us on the cross. So as Jesus prays, into your hands I commend my spirit, he's actually providing us with an example of what John Wesley would call the means of grace. How do we experience God's presence in our life? And John Wesley would say, that we experience God's presence through Bible study, through prayer, through worship, through service, so, through the sacraments. And so this is one means of grace, saying a prayer of trust, saying each day, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. I trust you with my life. When Jesus says, into your hands, I commend my spirit, the word spirit can mean breath or life or spirit. 
Jesus is trusting God with his, not just his spirit, but with his absolute life. So we're wondering how can we experience God's presence in our life? How can we experience these means of grace? One way to do that is to pray the prayers that Jesus prayed from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. One way is to know the end of the prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And to know that God really hasn't and that God is really there in our dark moments. And the third is to say, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. I trust you with my life. The last words that Jesus speaks from the cross in the Gospel of John offer us as much hope and trust and faith in God as his last words in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus cries out after he has said, I'm thirsty, and he has drunk the cup that he has meant to drink. Jesus cries out in a loud voice, it is finished, and then he gives up his spirit. Jesus has come to show us the character of God, the love of God, the depth of love that God has for each one of us. And he did that through his life, through his example, through his teaching, and now he has done that by giving himself up for us on the cross. Jesus died that we might have life and have it abundantly through his spirit. That is what has been finished. This is a cry of glory, a cry of victory. It's the one that Jesus wants us to remember. It is finished. Okay. Well said. I like I like what she had to say, talking about these thin places, places where heaven and earth touch. And so often we are touched by God's spirit when we're in our lowest, when we're struggling. And that really does help us. And how she talked about each of these seven last words or phrases are really prayers from Jesus. Father, forgive them. Uh, feeling forsaken at times. And prayers of trust, like, into your hands I commend my spirit, and it is finished. That is our hope, too, that our lives have meaning and purpose, and and God will be there from the beginning to the end, and then and then after that, even. So I, I want to thank Pastor Rob for sharing our thoughts this Lenten season. We'll go ahead and move into our Holden evening prayers. Let me get that set for us. Okay, let's see if I can do this. You can say a prayer that I can do this. I think I got it. Okay. Oh, oh. 
Okay, at this time, I'll have you unmute your mics. And think about if there's anything you'd like me to include in our prayers tonight. We, of course, want to, I think most of you know that Ken Andres's sister, Kathy Lynn Feld, died under hospice care. So we want to keep Ken and his family in our prayers. Anyone else have any special prayer requests tonight? And that's okay. We'll pray general prayers for our family, our friends, our church, our nation, our community. Lots to remember in our prayers. Let's take a moment. Gracious God, thank you for this ability to reflect on your word, for your presence, for your inspiration to us. Help us to remember that these events on the cross and through your life weren't just historical events from years ago, but really do breathe life into our spiritual life. I do want to remember Ken Andrus and Diana and their family on the death of Ken's sister, Kathy Lynn, and pray that you would give them comfort at this difficult time. I want to pray for all our family members, especially those that we name in our hearts at this time, who are especially struggling, mind, body, or spirit. I want to pray for our church, that you would continue to guide and strengthen it. I want to pray for our, our community and our state. I want to pray for our even our presidential election, Lord, that we might select good leaders, not only as president, but all our leaders in the elections to come. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We'll close with the golden benediction. Let me set that up for us. Let us bless our God, praise and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all. Okay, now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. All right, that's it. Remember, we have church, uh, our Palm Sunday service this Sunday, a week from Friday. We'll have a good Friday service at church at 630, and then a special Easter service a week from Sunday with a special breakfast afterwards.